I feel like I look super tired, even though I woke up like three hours ago. Do yeah. I look super tired? No, no, you look fresh. <laughs> I don't know, have a coffee with me. Um, hey, that's the bit. Yeah. That's the bit, Torrance. <laughs> All right. Should we get started? Sure, why not? Let's do it. Hey. It's the podcast of a generation with me, Miles Dobson. This week's guest, he's an actor, coffee professional, and avid Canadian, Torrance Coombs. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, I'm Miles Dobson, and with us, with us this week is Torrance Coombs. That's right. You even pronounced it. Even pronounced it correctly. Hey. I figured you I, would, but I, I thought maybe maybe there would be a bit or something, you know, where you just kind of... <laughs> Terentium Terence, Cumulus. Terence Combs. Terence Combs. Terence Cumulus. Anyway, hi. What are, you, what are we drinking this morning? Well, it's kind of a... I've got a little flat white action here. Why don't you describe to us what you define as a flat white? Because okay. I have thoughts. No, I know you have thoughts. So obviously, it's sort of like one of those <laughs> things like a macchiato that's been, I'm sure, uh, bastardized over time. But you asked me what my favorite coffee was. And I said, basically, a latte with way less milk in it is mm -hmm. what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. It's like more coffee than milk and no foam. Yeah, that's exactly what a flat white is. Okay, so I described it correctly. You did, but yeah. I think it's Starbucks. Starbucks has ruined everything. Right, so because go, even the flat white is a decent size, and also it's a cappuccino. You go in there, and it's their 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 idea is that it's it's um. Well, first of all, their macchiato is a latte. Oh no, it's now it's, 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 it's a caramel. It's a caramel. It's yes. <laughs> Welcome to coffee podcast. It's no, it's good. Well, you have to start with the coffee. Mm hmm. So, so the dangerous thing is now you've got a guest who's going to get into this with you. You know what I'm, I mean? That's, that's <laughs> why you're here. This is great. I tried to get a job at Starbucks um, ages ago after I'd worked in a regular coffee shop, a, a normal coffee shop. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, I got to ask, to the, and this was the assistant manager doing like my trial shift. I said, I got to ask, why do you call it a macchiato? Because a macchiato is, is um, coffee marked with milk so like why are your macchiato so large that's what macchiato means and uh and he said oh well yeah we use the german german definition so it's, it's milk marked with coffee <laughs> <laughs> so it's a massive amount of milk with like a drop yeah, of coffee in you the know middle what of it. at least props to him for having an answer even if it's bullshit I, what confused me was why he said the German definition. The German I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? The German, it's the same word. Well, I don't know. So not I, suddenly we're turning this into a Starbucks ad, but they have that. I don't know if they have it in Canada right now. They have that oleato thing where they, they stick olive oil in coffee. Olive oil. And it yeah. makes everyone poop. Oh, good. I should drink more. Um, yeah, the, no, the, it's, it's legitimately a laxative. Which is very funny because I have not purchased an entire one for myself, but when it first came out, they were passing around free samples and I was like, well, I should say hello. <laughs> and I tried them all. I was like, they're and actually pretty good. But I was yeah. like, you know what? That's, yeah, that's just coffee with olive oil in it, isn't it? <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I, was like, I don't know why I would. It doesn't taste yeah. bad, but I don't know why I would. <laughs> I, I, they've got to come up with something. I was watching, I was in, I was, I was, of course I was on TikTok. And I've I've mm -hmm. fallen into as, coffee as TikTok now. There is, is currently there is currently a scandal. Are you interested in the scandal I, of the I coffee am certainly. world? Please tell me. So so a uh, someone that won I don't remember names. Someone that won the barista championships one year has started a company where they developed the idea of putting a whiskey stone cold whiskey stone directly underneath where the espresso comes out before it goes into your coffee and it's supposed to blah 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 something make it better is the and idea like to shock and awe the espresso with temperature change rapidly and yes it's yeah. some hand wavery Curbs kind of nonsense of <clears throat> yeah and uh and so they they announced this product that they developed which is literally just imagine a coat hanger but one that you can a small one you can hold in your hand it's like about <laughs> si like the size of the size of like you know like a little a little um flipper or like a spatula sure and uh and it's a triangle and with a whiskey stone in the middle and you put it on top of the coffee cup and run the espresso over it that was what they developed and people people watched the launch video 
And they went, that's just a whiskey stone. So then people started putting whiskey stones under their espresso. <laughs> and then this company tried to sue people, <laughs> saying that they had the patent for running coffee over cold things. The cha- they, they tried to say that they had the patent for cold coffee. I guess. Like literally, like if the temperature of coffee changes, that they they had the rights to it, and uh, the coffee world went no. Well, I tell you what, look at it this way: can you blame them for trying? I guess it's sort of like <laughs> you know, it's it's like the actors right now. We're on strike. Can you blame us for trying? Yeah. We're all going to get yeah. overrun by AI and big tech. I know. Can you blame us for trying? I know that. Got to take your last stand at some point. <laughs> Well, it's very good though. This is a good. Uh, this is a good choice of coffee. Yeah. Mm. What I like about it is it features the coffee, but I also am a sucker for steamed milk. Hmm. But do you, it does, do you steam it at home? I do. Yeah, I have a nice espresso machine at home. Mm, that's can we, what I need. Can we get into this, Miles? Do you want to hear what I have? Of course we can. Of so course. Got that's a, what I've you're got here a, for. I've, I've got a Profitech Pro Three Hundred. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oof. It's like a prosumer, but user serviceable. You know, like a few steps yeah. above a Breville. Like yeah. I can go down yeah, to the yeah. hardware store and get all the parts for it, mm-hmm. and then um, and then I've got a uh, I've got a uh, Barazza Seti uh, grinder. Oh damn! You really, you really. I uh, went for it. Went for it, huh? Yeah. So Were none you- of it is like <clears throat> cafe grade, but the coffee is cafe grade. Like it wouldn't hold up to the rigors of cafe use and the the repetition. But to make yeah. a few coffees a day, it's like yeah, it's primo stuff. Yeah, because if you're going to do a coffee shop, you couldn't use it because it, yeah. just, it just wouldn't be able to handle the amount Can't of volume. Can't handle the you volume, yeah. Particularly the grinder. The machine could, nah, nah. Yeah. Yeah, another one. I would recommend neither for a coffee shop, but they're great for home use. Would you, um, would, would you, would you ever go into opening your own coffee shop, do you think? Have you become that guy? I don't know. I, I think, I don't know if I've ever, I'd ever go into opening my own shop of any kind. I think as soon as I've got to deal with the administrative part of it, I'll lose my mind. Uh, there's there's a part of me that has a dr- great desire to be a drone and and uh, and a cog in a machine, uh, not to shut my brain off, but just to absolve myself of the ultimate responsibility for something's failure. So I don't know. Like I'm an actor, right? I rely on people to write things for me and to produce things for me, and uh, and I'm you know, yeah. Yeah, any, so any, like, any job I've worked, I'm like, give me, tell me what to do. Give me a job, and I'll so do like, it really well. So like production, going into production of a show or anything like that, directing, that kind of stuff, that's a little bit too... It's not that I'll never do it. It's that I'll do it sort of kicking and screaming because other things aren't happening for me. Right, 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 right. I'm sure, I'm sure I'd to. develop. I think, I think directing is maybe it. I think yeah. Directing is well, maybe, we're all we're all adjacent. control freaks, really, aren't we? Yeah. 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 We all just we all want to be in charge of of how it goes, and then we get in the big boy chair, and we're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Because then you realize it's actually really hard to be in charge of things because now you have to delegate, and not everybody will do things the way you would have wanted to do them, and that can be incredibly frustrating as somebody who just wants to jump in there and do it right. Yeah. Yeah. As a director, I just want to give everybody a line reading. I don't know. <laughs> Say it like this, you idiot. <laughs> just do it better. Could yeah. you do one better? Yeah. That's the note I always ask for. I'm like, you could, it's a, a, an absolutely uh, defensible note to just say, can we just do that the same, but just do it better? I know what that means. Yes. I, I, better, internally, I know and, what that means. Com- and more talented. And yeah. if you could just be a different actor, that would be great. Yeah. More charisma, please. <laughs> Have you ever gotten like a, a really bad note that stuck with you? Um, mostly they're just notes that aren't useful. Things like like sort of a I stopped asking for feedback in casting because rarely is it useful because they see so many people that they're just like when pressed for feedback they're like uh uh too tall. You know what I mean? Like and it's so much more <laughs> than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's not Unless it truly just came down to that. So I remember back in the day, I auditioned for the Melrose Place remake. And they basically just came back and said, not good looking enough. They didn't say not good looking enough. They said not good looking enough. And then um, I ended up working on multiple shows for the CW. So apparently I was. So again, not a useful note. Who says that? Not good looking enough? That's outrageous. Isn't it just... 
God. I mean, that's grounds. That's grounds for like you know discrimination. What do you yeah. mean I'm not handsome enough for your show? Get out of here. But it's also like uh, that's how the, it used to be, though. Is people would just be blunt like that, and you're like, okay. yeah. They say, yeah, they're like like looking for a fat. Uh, ugly, you know, you, you know what I mean? The breakdowns just didn't mince words. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they got to be a little bit more tactful, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Wow. God. But so, so then, so then you, you didn't really get bad notes from, from when you were on set though. It was, it was always just casting. No, so the, the most frustrating note that I get sometimes, it's almost always in casting and not on set. On set, I get useful, practical notes from pretty much every director. Even if it's just, say it faster. Easy. Done. Oh, that's I know, easy. Yeah. But in casting, sometimes it's stuff like, the, the one that drives me up the wall is be more charming, more charisma. And because that's, that for me is so tough to translate because... Everybody has their own kind of charm. You know what I mean? The way that I charm somebody is not the same way you charm somebody. So if you can tell me, like, be more stereotypically charming or be, like, frat boy charming or be douchebag charming, like, that's a different thing than just saying, be more charming. Because that's, that's a tough one to translate. Yeah, and, I, and, and also, I, it's, it, it's also, like, is that not subjective? Is that not yes. completely subjective based on... I think I just repeated what you said, but I think that isn't that not completely subjective depending on who the person is like, yeah. uh, like, uh, uh, you know, charming of, you know, quarterback charming or whatever is going to mean different things to different yeah. people. Well, because some people, such a weird note. it is a weird note because some people really, truly respond to super cheesy used car salesman type charm. Yeah. And, or like, you know, the preacher, you know what I mean? I, like I watch somebody like Ted Cruz and I go like, who could possibly believe a word this guy says? He just, to me, is, has the definition of an insincere tone. And, and uh, completely aside from his politics, just the tone in which he speaks makes me mistrust him. But some people have the literal opposite reaction to him. And that's, that's fascinating to me. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, I mean... <laughs> We're not, we're not going to get too political. No, we, no, we don't. That's why I say it's not even about his politics. It's about a vibe you get from somebody and charm. Or we, we read signals from people differently and we trust different types of people and we respond to different types of people. Yeah. I think it's, that's kind of the, I mean, you know, Ted Cruz and then AOC are basically like the complete opposite ends of the spectrum on that right one, and there's people that just don't trust aoc as far as they can spit which is so interesting to me because i feel like to me that's the kind of person that i think has a lot of integrity and intelligence and thoughtfulness behind everything she says even if you disagree and i'm like but other people just go like absolutely not like that's wild to me that they don't that yeah. they that, well i mean how much of that do you think is I mean, wow. a, but a lot yeah. of it is tied to your pre-held beliefs. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like I feel like a lot of it is is that, and then the kind of poison that people are putting pouring in your ear from from whatever disgusting show you're watching on right, yes. on TV that's on just on in the background or whatever. I I would agree with that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's um it's interesting that you you kind of bring up the the. The, the the way that people interpret that because I think I think that's kind of where where we're all kind of going as a that's kind of led to the the what's the word not alienation the um the tribification is that a word tribification we can make it a word I think here's sure. here's the thing if it's not a real word we know what you mean and so okay, therefore yeah, it know, is a word shut up. yeah exactly you know what I mean no it, it, that that whole thing of like of of how people interpret um, other people's charisma and 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 their message and stuff has just kind of become like the main one of the main conduits of this tribification that that we're kind of going through. No, that's true. And you, yeah, you're you're always trying to sniff out who's in your tribe and look for the signals. And it's almost like. We do this with our identities and things outside of politics too, where, you know, like certain societal signals that we project, or for example, signals to project one's sexuality, be they mm. overt or implied. You know what I mean? Gaydar. That, that's sort of interesting because um, I, we almost have that for politics now. 
<laughs> and I think there's something in humanity where, yeah, we're, we're always looking for our tribe, looking for the people that we can trust just sort of implicitly. Does that feel, does that feel more or less? Cause you're in, you're in LA. Does that yeah. feel, does that feel pretty easy to, to kind of find people that are on the same wavelength as you, or do you still feel like that's pretty up there? Um, and you still have to be on, on the lookout. I tell you what's interesting is that it's very easy to find them here in a city full of, uh, I don't know, broken dreams. And, and it gets a reputation for having a lot of fake people who will promise you a lot of things. And certainly that exists, but it's also a city full of artists from all over the world who've congregated here in this weird, dusty hellscape. And, um, and just some of the most wonderful, talented underappreciated, beautiful, sincere, real people uh, exist here as well. And, I, and they're easy to find, frankly. I've, I've never had a problem finding them. Yeah. Um, and um, I've lost my train of thought on this a little bit, but I, I think that... What, circle back to the question again so I can remember where I was going <laughs> with this. <laughs> the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. No, That's the it's, problem. it's... Here, let's have another sip of this. We'll <laughs> No, I, I was asking whether whether the the living in LA, whether it's easier to find people on that same wavelength, whether you still have to kind of whether you can fall yeah. back on your laurels and make presumptions that most people are on the same wavelength, or whether you do still have to have that kind of um, you know uh, uh, you have to keep your wits about you a little. You have to keep your wits about you a little bit uh, coming from Canada. So particularly in Vancouver, where even my friends on, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, you know, dating conservative women and never even really thought about it. And now it's a, it's a thing, you know, and it's just, it, because of the tribalism, it's really, it's a thing down here where it's like, um, you can't just start spouting off politics and assume the person next to you is going to agree. And, uh, and particularly in the U.S., because there's a, um, a larger religious bent, let's say, you know, um, even... Even if people are not Christian conservative, there's an awful lot of Christians. And so that's more prevalent here. So I, that, I often find that's something I don't necessarily see eye to eye with people on. But that doesn't mean we can't be friends or you know, share ideas. But That's crazy um, to me that there's, there's, there's a, like a lot of conservative Christians in, in L.A. I would have thought that they would have felt like they'd set on fire as soon as they stepped foot in L.A. Well, it, what's, that's what's interesting is they definitely feel that as well. So you don't necessarily... <laughs> so you're talking to somebody else who you assume is on board, and then it kind of comes out that actually, oh, they say something that's a little bit... You're like, oh, okay. But are they not miserable? Yeah. Are they not miserable being... A, a lot of them are, and they want, they want out, and they... But yeah. But a lot of them too have kind of made peace with it, and you know, it's sort of like you see, like how's how's James Woods surviving in Hollywood? You know what I mean? But he kind of carries on, and and there, the more time I spend down here, the more I realize that those folks are around, and they just don't open their mouths about it. Like they just quietly go about their their politics and don't make it anybody else's thing. It's yeah. it's bizarre to me. I was seeing someone someone on again on TikTok. I have no life, by the way. I'm just on That's, TikTok now, which is, is funny because like four years ago, I was like, I'm not getting a TikTok. Stop asking. And now I'm yeah. consistently getting all of my talking points from TikTok. It's ridiculous. It happens. It happens. Yeah, I remember I was time. so resistant to Twitter back in the day when it was a thing. I was like tweeting. That sounds like the dumbest dumb dumb. And then I signed up, and it was a huge thing forever. Yeah. Are you still on? Are you still on? Uh, on Twitter. I've got have an account parked there, but I haven't posted there in months. Yeah. I've got it. I've got it because on some level, um, when work comes back, studios still care about it as a promotional wing. So I've got the, it's got followers. I've got the account parked and it, it helps. It's maybe a little dated as a concept, but it helps. I hate that. Um, I was, I was going to say that I saw on, on TikTok that um, this guy was like, he made a fake account um, pretending to be Judy Hopps from the movie Zootopia or, Zo <laughs> or Zootropolis, if you are uh, in, the, in Europe. That's right. It's, it's got a different title. I noticed that. Yeah. And, uh, but this was on the conservative dating app, The Right Stuff. Okay. <laughs> the, the 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 responses were interesting but i think the point i was trying to bring up was that i think it's 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 very kind of 
it's interesting that now there has to be uh, conservative dating apps because they've been chased, or the, the, very, the very fragile ones have been chased off of your Tinders and your Hinges and your Bumbles. Right. It, 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 that's actually an interesting <laughs> thought, isn't it? That, yeah, that it's like, I mean, part of it is just weeding people out, I guess, immediately f t to have somebody so more like-minded. And it, it speaks to that tribalism and that polarization we were talking about, where you feel like that's the most fundamental difference I cannot get past when dating somebody. This is a whole set of values that go together. These are teams. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, and if you were to cross that line, that's some star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet shit. Yeah, but then at the same time, like at the same time, it's like understandable. Like if you yeah. are, if you are, it, wow, I'm, I'm, I don't want this to become super political, but it's like if you, it, it, it does feel, especially in the states. I imagine it, it's very, it's very easy in the states for you to be seeing how, um, how polarized it's become and how, uh how difficult it must be for people to contend with let's say someone that's very a ted cruz supporter to to have that person involved in your life it, it, it's funny because it's difficult but it isn't and i've been encountering this which is like i'll meet somebody and i'll have a connection with them and we become friends and then i learn that that's a thing about them and i'm like that's so interesting because my experience with somebody and our our energies and the way in which we fundamentally get along as humans has nothing to do with politics and we could not be more opposed in how we got here and that's always fascinating to me because i'm like okay my 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 political gaydar was off on this one you know what yeah. i mean <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> you know? like, yeah so, <laughs> And, and and that's always a fascinating thing to me, which is like, how how did you arrive at being the wonderful person you are on a foundation of this? And that's um, and I feel like they feel the same way about me. So that's an interesting thing. And, and anytime I'm tempted to get too angry or dig in or just or cut everybody out of my life that thinks a certain way, I'm like, ah, no, I don't know how this happens exactly, but people are a product of their life experience, their upbringing. You know, most people's religion is whatever they were raised with, you know, including atheists, you know what I mean? Like, um, and it's hard to fault somebody for that um, or to, and, and, but unfortunately along with that now comes like, well, if you are, if you consider yourself evangelical, you also have to do this, that, and the other and judge people for being gay or whatever it is like yeah. that's, and, and, but not everybody truly does that in their heart like they're like are they just you can tell they don't really think that they like they're just kind of saying it but they're they're not practicing that hate yeah that's uh, that's like there's those people that that protest that the westboro baptist will protest protest basically anything yeah and then you'll have people that are, are and they're they're friends with people who are gay but they will still go and pick it gay yeah. events or they'll go picket gay soldiers funerals and things like that but they they are friends with gay people it's bizarre to me well you know what man i um i go and i go to the petting zoo and i pet all the cute animals and then i go home and eat a bacon sandwich <laughs> so like we compartmentalize we're humans we compartmentalize we yeah. we, we make yes. exceptions for our in for people we like and for things yes. we like yeah 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 yeah, yeah we, we designate oh these animals are cute and get to live with us and we eat these ones yeah. <laughs> so not a vegan then. <laughs> no, no. Although vegan food's delicious, like because that's always that's another sort of absurd thing, which is like people who dig in so hard against veganism, it's like meat only. <laughs> I, I don't eat a vegetable. Yeah, your like, Jordan why? Petersons, etc. Yeah, it's <laughs> just like, why don't you just steak eat, only? Yeah, why don't you just eat the veggies too? They're also good. Have you have you been trying to lower the amount of your uh, meat intake at all? No, uh, I can say frankly, uh, red meat. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I I don't eat a ton, but I, I eat a whole lot of chicken. I, I can't I can't really sugarcoat that. I eat a lot of chicken. Would you do the Would you do the 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 um the lab grown meat? Oh yeah, yeah. No oh problem. yeah. I don't have any particular fears about it other than it being expensive and or like 
how what what's the cost to produce it not just monetarily but environmentally you know those are those would be my thoughts so my understanding is that it's it it's more it's environmentally friendly or in more environmentally friendly because if you're if you're doing lab grown steak you you're don't not growing need all the animal. cows yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 but then that also kind of opens up the the ethical quandaries of well we can make cow meat yeah. So well, yeah. Well, yeah. So if we could, we can could we, make human meat for the cannibals, yeah, we, right? That's it. We, yeah. And so then, like, well, if we if we make sure it's like if it's lab grown meat, there's nothing in it. You know, that's going to be a, a thing for the super rich. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. the, the more there's a billionaire class, like I sort of think that, like, even when they when they're pedophiles, it's not even like they're attracted to kids. They just want something that only money can buy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, they just, they need the, they need the next level of thrill. You know what I mean? So for them, it might be like, like, all right, I've eaten the alligator. I've eaten the fucking, you know, I've eaten the, the puffer fish that can kill me. All yes. right, human meat. I just want to feel make it alive. Happen. Yeah, 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 exactly. Do you think that, do you think that's it for, for the, the, the ultra rich is that they just don't feel alive anymore and they're just chasing whatever they can to try and feel some sort of alive? Yeah. Well, genuinely you go, okay, I can buy any experience in the world and, and over and over again for the rest of my life, there's nothing I need to worry about monetarily. So where do I get my thrills from? And it has to be like an experience or something that's forbidden, that's taboo or that nobody else can have. And the money doesn't buy the experience, it buys like the cover up. It buys, you yes. know, it, yes. it buys the silence. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, this is a thought I had about, um, yeah, all the, the Epstein Island shit. And um, that I, I'm that like, I'm like, wild. it is wild. And it's like, um, it, I, I, I feel like it's at a certain point, you have so much money, it does just corrupt your humanity to the point where, yeah, nothing you you must just be numb to things because you can just pay anything to go away or pay to do anything you ever want buy anything you ever want so it has where's the meaning in any of it so you start thrill seeking yeah that's my thought honestly it it it, it yeah I, I that's that's a very good way of thinking about it to be honest for me like i i always wondered where where um you know jeff bezos etc's humanity is you know cuz they can they could end world hunger and still be the richest people in the world. And they always, they show evidence every now and then of having humanity and they do work with charity and they, you know, they, they take on charitable causes and do good mm. things for people. And that's always mm. interesting or occasionally we'll show an environmental a, conscience and you're like, but it, but it, yeah, it's selective. It's isn't always it? a tax write off though. That's yeah. when they'll, they'll do that. They'll, they'll, they'll only do it when it's still beneficial to themselves. Correct. Um, and it's, and so uh, were they always like that? Did they, did they, I mean, in the case of Elon, you know, blood diamond mine, I think that's probably up there, but, but you know, the, 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 the point, at, like, is there a, is there a certain amount of money that you get to that then your humanity disappears or it, were you always, you know, a sociopath and then you just managed to work your way up to the point of making that much money. That's, that's I what suspect keeps me awake at night. A lot of people who work their way up to having that much money had to be in a little bit of a sociopath in the first place or have some traits of psychopathy. Because at some point, in order to have that much money, you do have to stomp on somebody. Like, I just don't think there is a way to do it without exploiting somebody. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you know, but also you, maybe you work hard, you've earned it. People love your product and you, you, you're justified. So you go, okay. But then, but then you've bought into your own hype and say, everything I do now, therefore is justified. <laughs> Hence Twitter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so going from completely pivoting. Perfect. Would you, do you know, do you know many sociopaths as a Canadian then? Cause I feel having lived in Canada, uh, most people in Canada, probably the nicest people in the world. We certainly have that reputation. Um, when people learn I'm Canadian, they always go, "No wonder you're so nice." <laughs> I'm like that's interesting because I grew up with all I grew up with schoolyard bullies. You know, I grew up mm -hmm, with a bunch of mm -hmm. dicks. Having said that, one of my biggest bullies from back in the day reached out to me on Facebook to apologize, like as grown adults, in a way that he certainly did not have to do. And I was like, that's very funny and also very Canadian. <laughs> wow. Yeah. God. When was that? Recently? Uh, some years ago now. Yeah. Oh, right. Fair enough. 
Wow, reach out to you on Facebook. See, the only people that reach out to me on Facebook are the people that, like, well, first of all, I turn off my Facebook, but it's like people that I knew working in a bar 14 years ago that are like, hey, my my daughter likes the next step. Would you mind uh, giving her a phone call? I'm like, yeah. all right. Let's <laughs> all right so... Hang on. <laughs> Slow your roll there, buddy. I don't even remember your name. You were the DJ. <laughs> you were the DJ <laughs> in a bar that I used to get, that I caught mumps from. Can you just, can you just chill out, please? There's definitely an element of like, when you're on TV, people do come out of the woodwork and sort of, I mean, people that you didn't know even cared or were paying attention or had forgotten about definitely come out and congratulate you and sort of want to ask you how you're doing and maybe sort of like, I don't know, just have a little slice of that somehow. And I understand that impulse. Yeah. Over the years, friends of mine who would become fa really famous for something are going, you, you want to take part in that success somehow. Not like you're responsible for it, but it, there's this impulse to like want to be their friend extra hard. That's like, it's a little bit gross, but I recognize it in myself and I, I know when other people are doing it too. And I, I'm very understanding of it because I, I feel it too. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that that's a human thing, just wanting to be adjacent to success and hoping some of it rubs off. Like, you, like you don't need somebody to do anything for you directly. You're just kind of hoping that something in their aura or their energy is going to help you out. Yeah, and then you just ask them to be on a podcast with you, and then you're great. That's perfect. Um, yeah. <laughs> but do you do you think do you think that's because uh, I mean. You know, uh, you you did rain, etc. Yeah. Um. Do you think that 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 became less of a thing, uh, after rain, and then and then when you becoming with you becoming with you going onto Twitch and being slightly more available to the public? Do you think that that's a little bit? Do you think that that makes it happen less? Do you think people are like, oh, he's on Twitch, I can just say hi there? Yeah, I guess for some people, yeah. What's interesting is like, uh, I like I still on occasion will get paid a, a bunch of money to travel to a place in the world and do a convention to meet people and sign autographs, or I might be the bartender at your bar mitzvah, like for <laughs> for like for like a hundred dollars. You know what I mean? So yeah, uh, that's where my life is at right now. It's this hilarious duality about. Uh, an incredibly skewed importance. Like, so I'm sometimes I'm working my butt off with a, with a specific skill set in the service industry for very little money. And sometimes I just show up and exist and people throw a bunch of money and love it. Yeah. Me. And that's yeah, yeah, an yeah. interesting duality depending on the context. So obviously if like, if I guess if people could count on me or rely on me being in one particular spot, then maybe, I, I don't know what would happen. But yeah, I, to answer your question, I do think maybe, yeah, that having, being more accessible brings, like being on Twitch, it brings it down to earth a little bit. You, you develop a bit more of the, the, the parasocial thing. People feel like they know you a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, I, I like it because I was afraid to know people. I was afraid of stalkers i was afraid of things like that and then i learned that actually i remember hearing all the stories of like robin williams just like going somewhere and just crashing on a stranger's couch for funsies and i'm like ah just a little <laughs> bit more of that in your life you know what i mean like just 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 trust in people sometimes and occasionally you'll meet some weirdos but usually they're well-meaning weirdos do you not think that was a sign of the times though because i mean people used to hitchhike a lot and no one would hitchhike now unless they had a, like a death wish I guess, but I'm not actually sure the possibility of death is higher now, or the fear of death is higher. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I mean, we are both white men, though. That's slightly different. Well, yeah, I'm a white man, so I, I can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and? <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, no, no, it's fine. We can hitchhike. It's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not going to. I don't, I'm not going to palette swap and see what happens, you know? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Okay. But do you think, okay. So do you, 
yeah, I can still hitchhike. Yeah, okay, you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that was Robin Williams showing up at someone's house and being like, hey, let me sleep on your couch is just a sign of, you know, people not having, you know, been watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre or whatever? Or do you think it was, do you think it's like, do you think that's more, uh, like you said, it, it is just times haven't changed. We were all just a bit more scared. I mean, I, I'm not qualified to say, am I? But I think overall, even though we hear about all of this crime and stuff, violent crime overall is down. Yeah, so, I've seen that stat as well. So that's that's fascinating to me, which is yeah. um, like, so, so you know, obviously, especially in the US, we've got all these mass shootings, but they're happening, you know, so they're these highly destructive events, but the overall instances of violence for your everyday person are down. I don't think I would ever go hitchhiking if I, unless I was like in a, in a bind, if I was in a huge, but I wouldn't make it like, cause there were people that would just be like, Hey, I'm just going to hitchhike across the America. And it's, I'm yeah. mm. hitchhiking. No, although I, I don't know if you ever had this. Have you ever been driving and then, or I don't know, but I, 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 sometimes I'll be driving along and I see somebody like just miss their bus. or you see a hitchhiker like needing a ride somewhere. And I want to be the person to be like, I'll just, I'll give you a ride, man. Um, but then you're like, okay, I don't know if this person is dodgy or more likely they're going to think I'm super dodgy just for offering. And then it never happens. And you've missed out on this moment of humanity. But is that the Canadian in you though? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but also I, I don't think I'd be comfortable hitchhiking. Having said that, let's say, because the problem with hitchhiking is there's no time to get a vibe off somebody before they're in your car. So, or before you're in their car. So this is true. Whereas like people all the time will like meet somebody at a bar and go home with them. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can get a vibe for a minute. Yeah. And that's a stranger too. You don't know much more about them than you do about the car you're hopping into, but somehow it's different. That's true. That's true. Do you do a lot of road trips? Man, I used to. I don't these days. No? No. I used to, when I was a kid, I would do uh, cross country road trips with my parents. We'd drive across the U.S. Wow. See all kinds of stuff. You know, wow. take seven days just in the car and camp along the way. God. Yeah. That's such a that's such a foreign concept for me, because like, you know, England, it's it's seven yeah. seven or eight hours just to get across the country, like top to bottom. Like the right, whole thing yeah. is not that long. I've I did a I did a road trip through the English countryside some years back. Oh, did you? Through, yeah, through the Cotswolds and yeah. Oh, very yeah, nice. Very, very sweet. I mean, that's not, that's less about covering distance and more going to the town a half hour over and then plunking yeah. down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why would you, why did you, why did you go on a road trip around England? Well, for, I was actually, well, at the time um, with my, uh, my ex-wife, we were doing a, um, a, uh, a collaboration with the tourism board there. And uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just, he just went on a, wow. God, that's a job. It was a job, yeah. So we just stayed in the, all these little towns in the Cotswolds and went horse riding and just kind of documented the whole thing. We also went to we also went to Wales and did some like we went to um, where did we go? We went to um, Cardiff and we went to uh, Abergavenny and we you know we toured the uh, the Pendarren Distillery. You know, so, oh wow! Yeah, we did a bunch of stuff. You've done a lot of Europe, then. I've done a lot of Western Europe yeah. and a tiny bit of Eastern Europe. Yeah. Do you have like favorite places? Do you, are there places you'd go back? Clearly not Romania. And I presume you'd go to Romania during the daytime because I remember you went to Romania. I mean, I'd Romania go back in the nighttime, the nighttime too. It's not like I wouldn't do it again. It just almost killed me. So it's both. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, for, for context, anybody listening, I shot a Christmas movie in Romania in July and it was three weeks of night shoots. So I, I, felt, I felt like a vampire. I felt physically ill the whole time. Um, just this weird low level nausea through the whole thing because I just wasn't sleeping. My whole rhythm was thrown off. Yeah. Uh, very fun movie to do though, honestly. And it's, it makes, makes for a good story. Um, no, I, I, man, I'd go back basically anywhere. That's always the conundrum, isn't it? Go back somewhere you've been or see somewhere mm, new. Yeah. Um, I but, know there are some people that like, they'll, they'll go a place and be like, oh, I could go there anytime. I could go there and like... <laughs> I could go and hang out and go to my favorite places and, and I could go there whenever I wanted. And there's other people that are just like, oh, I've done it once. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, that would be, I've been fortunate enough to go back to Paris about eight or nine times now, mm. or uh, Dublin is like that for me. Uh, London's like that, honestly. Um, um, yeah, and uh, then I, I, I've been to Iceland twice, loved it so much the first time I went back for more. Is that Reykjavik? So I went to Reykjavik the second time. The first time I just went on like, I was there for like two days and rented a car and just saw, went on this kind of like 10 hour drive for a day just to see as much as I could. And it was the most stunning thing I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. So um, so we planned a, a two week road trip um, for the next year and went back and went around the entire country. Wow. Um, yeah, and because... Uh, you get this craving to get more and more remote. The, 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 the farther away you get from the city, you get this craving to go deeper into the land of just like volcanoes and fjords and puffins and, you know, glaciers. And <laughs> so, yeah, there's so much cool stuff. And, and then the northern lights, and then you're just sort of, yeah, eating these wow. fresh fish. And I don't know, it's just a really special thing. It, 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 they're very, very environmentally conscious there. They, they, um, they're stewards of the land. They're very conscientious, um, very like educated, intelligent, kind people there. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting to talk to. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's Mars, man. It's like, you feel like you're in the Mars <laughs> rover, just kind of, you just take a right turn and you're going over these volcanic sand dunes and, and, you know, and then there's some kind of like hot geyser coming out of the ground and it's just, and the, everything's, yeah, it's like volcanoes caked in ice and moss and then frozen waterfalls and all kinds of cool stuff. Wow. Yeah, I've never been, I've never been to, I've never, honestly, like for the amount of time I spent living in the UK, I spent very little time in Europe yeah. going around when I had the opportunity before the dark times. I, I, I've explored very little of North America, all told, and very little, I mean, I've, I've done some of it now. I mean, other than those road trips, which I guess is some of that. And, yeah. But I grew up in Canada and there's so much of it I haven't seen. Yeah, I've done Vancouver and, and some of ontario and that's right. it yeah yeah but then i don't drive so that's the thing that's the thing right. for me is that it's it's especially on this side of the on this continent there's very it, it's a very difficult time trying to get uh anywhere that you don't have a car public transport is out. is very very few and far between yeah in the cities it's all right but but getting elsewhere and getting around is not ideal drives me nuts coming from europe a lot of people they'll go to europe from from you know canada or or, or the, the states and they'll be like yeah god i lost so much weight there the food's just so much better and you're like no you just walked everywhere yeah yeah <laughs> you just you just took the you didn't drive you took the bus and walked everywhere and you lost 10 pounds good job that's 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 what it's like guys yeah. when you have public transport even if it's super expensive and being run into the ground by the government sorry well it is i mean i i love it uh and i'm honestly yeah the city most like that in canada is toronto of course yeah, uh, yeah vancouver's yeah, yeah. got decent transit as well I'd, I'd wish they had more sky train subways things but it's all right would you move back to canada yeah yeah i think so that's uh, that's an interesting question i've been facing I've had a couple opportunities now, uh, like crossroads in my life where that question comes up, like, it, do I want to stay in LA? Do I want to move back to Canada? And something mm -hmm. compels me to stay in LA. Um, and I don't know if I'm just hooked on the idea of what it could be, you know, the, the vastness of the dreams down here, but also, you know, it is also a place where dreams go to die. Um, <laughs> So you, there has to be a certain amount of delusion in you to stay down here and keep plugging away at it. But then sometimes it works for people and I've had some success in the past. So I don't know. It's that, it's that thing that people do where they're like, oh yeah, I was going to quit acting. And then the week before I quit, I got the office or I got fucking yeah. Mad Men or whatever and, and end up my career path changed entirely. The other thing that happens is that I, growing up in Vancouver, it seemed like a big city to me. And mm. now having lived in LA, it feels like a really small city to me. LA? Um, yeah. yeah. So L so LA, LA just blows your whole sense of scale up. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think, you know, just how many, and it's not, I mean, obviously the studios are here, but like, you know, the nerd bars, the board game cafes, the, the restaurants, the sort of 
any concert in the world. And the other thing I love about LA is any actor or, or any person I've ever met in, uh, you know, England, Spain, Canada, Australia, everybody ends up here at some point. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's a hub and it's a city that people come to either as tourists or for business. And, uh, so there's a lot of people I get to reconnect with because I'm here, which is kind of cool. It, it brings together all these people because I've done so much work, uh, overseas and you know, you don't get to see those people as often as you like, but yeah, you get a chance here. Do you think, do you think that's going to, you know, cause we're in the middle of the strike, you know, strike of, of the generation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, no one really knows how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think this is kind of a turning point? Do you think this, this could be a, a, a point at which, you know, um, there's a breakup of, of Hollywood at all? Do you think it would be relocated to New Orleans and New Orleans becomes the new Hollywood or Toronto becomes the new Hollywood or Vancouver? Or do you think it's just going to kind of, the dust will settle and it'll just kind of go back to normal? I suspect that LA will remain the hub of operations, but increasingly, uh, I mean, so much shoots in Atlanta, New Orleans, and um, and Toronto, Vancouver, and uh, more markets. You know, plenty of shooting in New Mexico as well. So the more these places make more things, the more you have trained crews on the ground there, the more they production they can accommodate. Um, increasingly, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of stuff is shooting in Utah now as well. Utah, uh, yeah, really, yeah. They're they're courting film industry stuff there, and they wow. they make they make a bunch of Hallmark movies, and they do um, yeah. Well, the Christmas ones. Some of them, yeah, but in not Utah. Not, not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily the Christmas ones, but yeah, yeah. Christmas in the desert. <laughs> well, like Park City, you know what I mean? They shoot in Park City. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> Sorry, I just just the I just love the idea of his like Christmas by the tumbleweeds. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, so, so but in Utah, like in Salt Lake City, they got these beautiful snow snow cap mountains. You know, you've got. I know, every, yeah. I, know I get but, it. I, I just I just immediately just think like the desert when it comes to Utah for some fair. reason. That's fair. you know. Are you fan? Are you f fond of Utah? I didn't just thoroughly insult you, did I? By no. Well, I, I'm not going to thoroughly insult Utah. Certainly, it, that was an eye opener. I shot a movie there, mm -hmm. and um, um, yeah, with a with a with an all Mormon crew, which was really oh, interesting. Lord. Yeah, wow. What so was they that were, like? It was. They were lovely. Um, they were really uh, welcoming and um, really understanding of my <laughs> of my lifestyle and, and as a exists in opposition to theirs. Like they had coffee available for me. They gave me the use of the, the company car on my day off so that I could drive out to the Sundance resort where I could actually get a cocktail. So wow. the, like the, um, so me and my co-star, we went to um, uh, Cindy Busby. We went to, uh, uh, after, after filming one day, we went to a restaurant to go, you know, grab a drink and a bite uh, to unwind after work. And uh, we, we wanted to go to P.F. Chang's, but there was a, like a three-hour wait because it was the only restaurant with a liquor license anywhere in the city. <laughs> so we went to the Mexican place next door and we thought, well, surely they'll just have, there's no wait here. We'll just get a margarita. We get, we get a margarita? He goes, oh, sorry, we don't have them. I mean, what do you mean? He's like, oh, we don't have the liquor license. He said, yeah, we used to have it, but the liquor licenses are so prohibitively expensive and nobody in this city drinks. So you don't ever make your money back on it. Like, but P.F. Chang's is the only one that does because now they're the place that has the liquor license. Wow. Yeah. So it's not even that these places are morally opposed to serving booze. It's just so prohibitively, uh, it's not cost efficient for them to even have the liquor license because nobody orders it. Wow. God, that's a life. It's interesting. Yeah, and everything's closed on Sundays. And again, this changes when you get outside, like when you go to like Sundance Resort or Park City or things like that. So. Um, but it was just different. Yeah. And, you know, people, people feel like they're being a bit cheeky when they drink a soda. So like, like, it's just, it's a different sort of lifestyle, man. But everybody was really nice, honestly. Like I, I, I have to admit, I came in expecting to be kind of judgy about it. And I, 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 or, or you know what it is, is I preemptively get judgy because I feel as though I'm about to be judged. 
when yeah, I'm the minority coming sure. into a situation. And I, sure. I genuinely never felt judged by these folks. And I did talk to some ex-Mormons, you know, people whose lives, you know, fall in the margins, you know, like they're, they, they don't fit neatly within that society and there's a dark side to it. And they're, you know, that people get ostracized and, uh, you know, excommunicated or whatever the terminology is for things that I would, I'm a little bit horrified by. But um, by and large, I was worried that I was going to suffer the judgment or be preached to in some way. And that was literally never the case. They could not have been nicer or more understanding of where I was coming from. It's sort of like, it, it reminds me of how uh, the Mormons literally advertise in the program for the Book of Mormon, like which could not Mormon, be making yeah. more fun of them, but they've decided yes. like you catch more flies with honey and yeah. they, they really live by that. Yeah. That's, that's, I, 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 I'm, I, I, um, <laughs> I, I'm very out of date with my knowledge when it comes to Mormonism. Yeah, I, I I know the top level stuff, but I yeah. know that there's a lot of stuff that they would prefer is not discussed and all those kind of things. Um, and then conversely, I'm like too knowledgeable about Scientology and the right. and yeah. the, the wildness that is is their their entire um, religion. I know. So here's the thing: is uh, with all of these things, if you focus too hard on the religion, you'll especially if you're not a religious person, you'll drive yourself crazy. So mm -hmm. what you have to instead look at is the, like the community and cultural aspects of it, which I think is the most important thing to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And like, so, so everybody there is like beautiful and 25 and has six kids. Like, like it, like, and it's just different. That's just how they do it there. Yeah. And it's like, and, and they're, they live in beautiful houses and they have the, this very sort of community centric mindset and everybody, eats really healthy and it's like you're kind of like, they kind of have it figured out like if the, if this is your lifestyle if you fit neatly into this and this fills your soul they've really got it figured out yeah and and but it, I, like i said if you're somebody who kind of falls through the cracks of that or or lives in the margins somewhere um i think there's a dark side to it that is unfortunate that you know there's a lot of good people trying to work on making that better but I, you know it, it's not the best for everybody it's an uphill battle yeah yeah it's and I think that kind of brings us back to the to the the tribalism type thing mm -hmm. earlier, not tribification, as I mistakenly said. Well, tribification is like the act of becoming more tribal or tribalist. So I thank think it's still a useful I, word. Th thank you so much for trying to help me there. I appreciate it. <laughs> but that's I think I was I was what uh, watching this video on third places and how we don't have them anymore. Okay. As societies, we don't really have a third, you, you know, you have your home, you have your job, and then your third place. Which would be and like church or whatever, right? Church, yeah. 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 So it used to be church or, you know, in England, it was the pub or, you know, because of course that's our church. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, or like, uh, you know, the sports clubs or the the libraries and stuff like that. And libraries are, 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 are a lot less prevalent than they used to be and what have you. And, and, and so... Um, you know, you look at the people that that are still in Canada protesting uh, vaccine mandates that don't exist anymore, and it's become their third place. They look forward on the weekends to going and protesting with the six people that they really like at those at those things, and well, so that's that's understandable that you would, uh, like you say, you look for that community in in uh in whatever way you can that resonates with you yeah dude in la right now day one of the sag of sag joining the pickets mm -hmm. it was a it was a party it was you know it, it was so many people just so glad to get out of the house so many actors wanting to go like be seen and be actors and just chant the fucking <laughs> slogans like what do we want fair pay when do we want it yesterday you know like uh, like it's a social thing. The mood is joyous. It's not somber. It's not, are we ever going to work again? It's like, yay, people. Um, so I do think that we're a bit starved for that, and, mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily get enough of it. And so now you've told a whole, a whole industry of people, there's, no, there's not even the possibility of work. You're not missing anything right now. This is what you have to do right now. 
other than your catering job. But uh, like, um, I was going to bring that up when you were talking about it earlier. But do you think that that's that like the 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 kind of duality of your lifestyle right now is kind of the epitome of of the degradation of standards for not just actors but for for people uh, overall because i feel like previous generation of actors would have you know a two series three series under their belt that's that's a house that's a house and a and a career that's them they are locked in now whereas um especially with streaming coming in a lot more it 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 seems like that's not not the case anymore and people are you know working class actors even though you'll like recognize their face you might not know their name but you'll recognize their face from being on a bunch of shows but they're still because of the way that um you know the, these companies you know talk about ups which is the big big company next that's going to go on strike or or, or janitors um custodial staff on the trains in the united kingdom all going on strike because that that idea of I'm working a full time job I'm you know I have a career and yet I'm not making enough to actually have a you know a life that would be associated with it do you think that's do you think that's kind of the vibe that they're giving off now yeah it's uh, yeah I mean L A has always to some degree been full of working class actors people who you see on things but you know get they've guest starred on every single show for one episode. And then the residuals are helpful and they supplement things and then, but then they work something else part-time to just kind of do it. Um, but what I think you're seeing is it's really not just actors. What we're lucky as actors that we have this union to take a stand. Uh, the musicians got fucked. Um, yeah. That's not a viable career for all but the, the most successful people. Um, but you're seeing it not just in entertainment, but everywhere. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people that I work with in catering have another like, they work full time at the bank and then also they work catering and events and they drive for Uber because it's not enough. Yeah. Um, and so people are just being squeezed so desperately in every, um, in every industry, um, as, as, uh, uh, the wealth concentrates further and further at the top. Um, so I really feel like, um, yeah, it's not just, a, I mean, this is, particular one is an actor's and a writer's fight, but uh, labor uh, is needs to undergo a transformation generally uh, yeah. for everybody, I think. It, de it definitely feels like that seems to be the case that, like, I've been saying this for a while, that, you know, after World War II, that was the point where they, we got the most social mobility programs bar none you know you, the national health service in the uk i think ohip was created after world war ii as well um a lot of social programs taxing the the very rich was you know at like 90 percent, and that was because they they just come out of a world war and they needed they needed to restart everything because everyone was hurting yeah and for some reason we don't think of covid as the same thing we don't think of we don't think of of three years of everyone being locked in their homes and people dying the same way as we do as people dying in a war and having to go into air raid shelters. Yeah, if, but, if anything, we've managed to make the enemy each other rather than the virus. Yeah, it's it, it's ridiculous to me that that's not seen more that way. That we don't see it more as as this being a post war. We were war. We were at war against a virus. And now well, we need the post-war recovery, and we yeah, don't have that. That's true. But it was going this direction even before the pandemic, let's be honest. The, the pandemic accelerated the wealth going, but um, it was going this way anyhow. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's kind of... It, it was the point at which things tilted too far for people to be okay with it anymore i think i think it, we were headed to this point anyway but if the pandemic hadn't happened i think it would be another 20 years before we get to that point it's just accelerated it that's possible yeah it definitely every and i think everybody's feeling it a little bit like this isn't sustainable so mm -hmm. um what's what's next yeah what what happens when 
you know, like 90% of your population literally can't afford to live or is just in so much, is just buried in debt, your whole economy will collapse. Like, you know, so, but there just does seem to be such a short-sightedness in it as people just gather more and more wealth. Yeah. Um, like, like your whole, the, the ground's just going to come out from under you guys. And so we have to do multiple, you, you know, it, it's not right to be doing for having four jobs and not being able to afford a home. That's not okay. That's it's, not it's absurd, viable. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like I'm very lucky that, that I was able to pivot to Twitch during the pandemic. Mm. Um, but you know, there, like that's, I, that, that should be something I do for fun. That shouldn't be me looking to be like, okay, well maybe this is a way that I can pay my bills. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, 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 that's busking. It's, it's, in, it's inherently busking on the street and looking for people to support my, my art. That's exactly, it, it's, yeah, basically that's it. Do you, do you find, do you feel that, but am I, sorry, I don't want to speak for you when it comes to Twitch because, because you were also on Twitch. So I, I, like, do you think it's busking as well? Do you feel like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely busking. Yeah. Mm. But fun. <laughs> it, it is yeah it is fun it, it's it's um yeah it's like it's so it's sort of like a combination of busking and doing a live podcast i guess and like you know it's kind of it's it merges a bunch of different things yeah did you think you'd always do it did you think you'd always go you would end up like when it when it started peeking its head were you like oh i'll, I'll get on that eventually or was it just was it because you started during lockdown right so yeah was that what was I should have done? Is started a year earlier because I've spent all day every day playing video games anyhow. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was kind of late to it. Mm. Um, so, I think, yeah, I, 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 I tell you what, I don't know. Maybe it was something I was always curious about. I just didn't think anybody would care to watch. Um, yeah, same. They still don't for me, but they, I mean, it's debatable whether they do for me too. But like, um, no, there's I, I got a I got a small and but dedicated group of people that likes hanging out with me, or at least I did. We'll see when we come back and start doing it again. If uh, who's back? Yeah, because you just you just bought the new microphone, which is if you're watching the video, this is Terrence's Hope new microphone right. that that he's he's very proud of. Still needs new headphones, but that's okay. We'll get there. Yeah. No, the, um, yeah, no, mostly I'm proud of the microphone because I, I found it used, which was a happy day for me. So just, just shout out for, uh, so be careful buying these things off eBay because they're mostly fakes, but I got this one from Guitar Center, which is a licensed, sure, uh, 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 distributor. Yeah. He's got the, and, he's got the sure mic, which is the professional, the, pro, the, the mic of the yeah. pros. But this one, yeah, well, it's like it's like the de facto podcasting mic. You know what it is? Like other mics sound great. This one just has this particular thing where the mount on it is very unobtrusive. The wire kind of is tucked away and just so it's not kind of coming out the back and snaking around the arm. Like so it's a very clean mic visually if you are also filming. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I had I think, to I had to switch out because I had one that was over the top of my monitor. Right. And uh and it was it was too far away. And I don't have enough desk space for it to reach me any other way. And so I was having to turn the volume way up and I was getting the echoing. So right, I got this yeah, under yeah. the I got this under the mic under the, the monitor the, the, mic the, stand. The low profile one. Yeah. It looks and good. it's it's good. It it sounds a lot better and it helps with um helps with my like uh voice audition things and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I, yeah. I you know, I've got the panels up, but the panels don't really do much when it comes to echo or anything like that. Do you do much voice work? Uh, I don't do much voice work. I have done some. Uh, I've, I haven't had a voice audition in a minute, uh, mm -hmm. but they come up. Would you want to, because I feel like you've got a good voice for it. You've I, got I, a I would love to. I, I was taking classes for it before the pandemic mm -hmm. hit, and then obviously you weren't gathering in a recording studio yeah. during COVID. So it's been a few years since I was taking those classes. Um, but I tell you what, there was a, something slightly discouraging about them, which is as we were taking them, uh, he said, okay, 99.9% .9 of voice work is non-union and it's um, just doing radio commercials using your natural voice. 
he says you, people do this they want to get into cartoons they want to do that and he's like that's there's not a lot of that there's it exists but it's a small percentage of people to get to do it so again it's another hustle i have the audacity to think i could do it i and that i'd be good at it but it's competitive and uh there's a lot of people already doing it a lot of people trying to do it yeah so anytime you sort of think, oh, this would be a cool side hustle or like, you know, another thing I could also do, you realize, actually, you want to do that, you're starting from the ground up. Like I got friends doing that with producing, right? You know, they're, they're like, all right, I'll start producing. Fine, nobody's going to give me work. I'm going to produce my own movies. And they're like, all right, well, you're starting from the ground up with that too. You got to get, you just got to hustle. You got to pitch shit. You got to do, you got to have 20 projects on the go and then maybe one will garner any interest and then good luck if it gets made in the next 10 years, asshole. Wow. It's crazy just how like the how prolific you have to be and how much time you have to dedicate to things to get anything made. Yeah. So, um I think that's why we need to all do something on TikTok. Just produce it on TikTok, put it out right. there for the world. Yeah. Or YouTube. I, although although YouTube now feels like it's it's for late night clips rather than rather than new content, you know? Right. Yeah. Like the last time I remember ever going like, oh, a web series on YouTube, I'll watch that, was The Last Writer's Strike. Right. I don't, I don't yeah. remember ever going like intentionally looking at web series on YouTube. Well, it's interesting. There, TikTok has this and YouTube has this, which is like you just have to, and it's part of their charm, honestly, is you have to sift through so much crap to find real talent. Because uh, a lot of it is just bored people shit posting, which is fine. That's, and that's great. <laughs> And that has value. And sometimes they inadvertently stumble on something really interesting or hilarious. Like they have a, a weird human moment that people connect to and it goes viral. But yeah. like um, a lot of it is just really low effort sketch comedy that isn't funny. <laughs> Speaking of sketch comedy, I just saw Britannic has come back to YouTube. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Um, Bri familiar. Brian Kosher. Okay. okay. Uh, um, Brian Kosher, Nick Kosher, and uh, Brian—I can't remember his last name—but um, they they were they wrote for SNL. Okay. They did ske they did sketches on YouTube, and then they like they were on <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream with Joss Whedon, and then they went and did work on SNL, and now they're back in LA doing sketch comedy, and they've just started a Patreon. <laughs> okay, and they're doing and they're doing video podcasts as part of that Patreon that they post to YouTube. It's good? I don't know. I haven't watched it yet, okay. but it, it, it's, uh, I'm not, I, I can't afford the Patreon, but, oh, um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's, we've come full circle. The, the, the people that started on YouTube have, have had their, the whole way through their career and now they're back to YouTube again. <laughs> It's funny because I guess it's tempting to think of that as like a regression or like some people might think like, oh, back with your tail between your legs. But I actually just think it's cyclical. I think that, um, and I'm learning that too with my career and and just talking to other artists. Like, uh, you know, whether, whether uh, uh, people work a restaurant job and then they go do things and they get a series regular, they do, th you know, they have a career and then, and then it's like, oh, actually, I'm going to pivot to uh, directing for a while. And then somebody offers them an acting job and then they maybe open up a business. I have a friend who's uh, uh, an actor and she just decided to like open up a like buy a vineyard. You know what I mean? Like open up a winery. You know what I mean? And it's like that was never on the radar before. But people, I think it's probably useful and instructive as an artist to never put yourself in the box it's powerful to say I'm an actor, I'm a musician, and to stand by that and to and to and to define yourself that way so that people don't stomp you down and go like, oh, you're a waiter who's trying to make it as a blank. Yes, but, agreed. But I think also that this idea that it's always a work in progress, like the art itself, it's never mm. it's never finished. Um, you're a work in progress, and you don't have to be any one thing forever. And you can also do other things. So. You can also do this, and that doesn't mean you're not an actor. You can also do this, and you're, and to and to not see it as a failure when you're doing something else, but just as another aspect of your life and and who you are, um, I think is helpful. And I've had it's taken me a minute to come around to that because I defined myself as an actor for so long and was able to do just that. Um, so to kind of suffer that uh, ego death, but then 
um, discover there's other things I'm good at and that I like to do that I can also do. And also going back and becoming a bartender doesn't mean I'm never going to act again. Like that's not what that means. It doesn't mean I've lost interest in it. Yeah. It's just like, uh, it's just, uh, it is what it is for now. It's a different phase of things. Yeah, I think that's also, I think, I think that kind of ties back into the, the idea of the previous generations actually being able to just have one thing and that be their career. And I don't think that's, it, it's, it's the same mentality as, oh, you should, you should only be paying 30% of your income on rent. Or, oh, if you go to university, you get a job straight out of the gate once you have a degree. It's this old world mentality that just has kind of been dragging everyone down because that's not the state of the world anymore. Yeah. And yet that's still what we all keep telling ourselves and 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 uh, making ourselves feel worse because of it. When it's really like, that's not how the world well, works anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, our older generations who are largely in... in charge of government they're they're very out of touch with that yeah they they just can't conceive of i mean honestly i have trouble conceiving of it even myself when i went to university it was twenty five hundred dollars canadian per year mm -hmm. um so my entire university education would have that would put that at uh ten thousand dollars for a four-year undergrad degree total. yeah yeah and I hear stories like people like, yeah, it's yeah, it's forty grand a semester. I know. Like, really? Like, how? Yeah. Uh, and Just any way, any way to get money off of us. And frankly, I don't. Uh, my education was so valuable and kickstarted my career. But if you said to me, like, knowing everything you know now, would you pay, uh, you know, that amount of money, two hundred thousand dollars for that? I'd probably, I'd say no. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's hard to say, yeah. It's a shame because it would be nice if more people just kind of went to college just because, because it was affordable. Because you'd end up with a more educated populace, you know what I mean? Well, one would or hope. People, well, you'd hope, or like, because the idea of college is it teaches you to think a little bit more critically, ideally, or to, you know, tries to teach you some media literacy and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's It's more about the being around people with a broad being around a broader variety of people i think yeah. is the deal i don't mind being around a bunch of broads all right all right all right all right have you got okay boomer on that note yeah. have you got <laughs> <laughs> have you got time for a, an advice question quickly can i yes, keep you on we for should a do bit it. yeah we got it all right it okay there's no jingle so we're gonna go straight into it <laughs> unless you want to make a jingle uh Advice with Miles and Torrance. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Uh, this is from Sama. This is uh, this is people on my Instagram and Discord and and my Twitch channel mm -hmm. and uh, and you know etc. Um, for context, I'm going off to my third year of medical school after my summer break, and I won't have much time for any recreational projects that I'd want to start or get off the ground once I do start my third year. I have so many projects and endeavors in mind. I want to do, learn, read, and experience so many things. It's really overwhelming. Question is, where on earth do I start and how do I even begin organizing my time? I feel like my summer vacation is a great opportunity that I'm going to ruin because of my lack of time management skills. I appreciate any advice you would throw my way. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. and I figured that that would be a good question because both of us have to juggle a lot of different things and we both have creative endeavors and those kind of things yeah. so i feel like we both have some good insight especially especially you because you have have such a broad career i think the challenge is um when you're overwhelmed by too many different things that you could do that you're interested in that you might be good at mm. it's easy to start none of them it's yeah. easy to do absolutely you know <laughs> yeah. what i mean that, and that's frequently a problem that i have yeah. Which is like, well, I could do that, or I could do that, or I could do that. Well, let's let's uh, shelf that for a minute. I'll come back to it and like, make yeah. a decision. And then before you know it, you've pissed away a bunch of weeks where you were hoping to have accomplished something. Yeah, absolutely. So I think so rather than um, labor over which thing would be the best to do or make the most sense, like... I don't know, just like pick one that's speaking to you right now and start on it and just like get the ball rolling on something. And then at least if you didn't get to everything you wanted to get going on, 
you got yeah. to something, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You 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 started playing the guitar or whatever, whatever. You know, I, I don't. It, mm-hmm. It's a it's an open ended kind of. I don't know what these different things are. These different pursuits are, or if it's mm. travel or if it's whatever. But just like pick one. If it's travel, book the flights. Like just do it. Just book it now, and then figure everything else out around that. Because then you actually have like, you know something to anchor everything else around yeah yeah i think that's a that's a really good idea of just like especially if it is travel like setting the ticket and then booking and then like planning the rest of the time around you know that deadline yeah. but also just you know setting uh, uh i always really like the 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 531 rule i do this with my girlfriend if trying to trying to decide on uh where to go for dinner mm-hmm you know you pick five places she picks three places you pick one of the three places and you can do that on your own as well so you pick five pick five things that you definitely definitely would be really sad about not doing mm. and then and then pick the three out of those ones and then pick the pick one out of those three and then see how that makes you feel and if you feel really bad that you didn't pick one of the other three Especially if it's like, oh, I wanted to do baseball and I wanted to read this book and I wanted to do this and oh, I really want to read the book. Then you then you have your answer. Mm. Pick the pick something and then f- and then how you feel about the other things will inform your decision. It's true. Sometimes when something's taken away from you, you realize how much you valued it. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, mm. that's that's sometimes a really good way of of figuring out. Like sometimes if I have a, a, a couple of things, I'll just flip a coin and then the result will tell me how I feel about the thing that I didn't get about whether it was a big deal to me or not. And right. in terms yeah, of time yeah, yeah. management, in terms of time management, I mean, like if you're only doing it for the summer, yeah, you, you're on the deadline. The deadline is what's causing your executive dysfunction, I think. So you've got to just, you've got to just make sure that, that your calendar, using your calendar as much as you can yeah, and trying to get out of your own, head really although <laughs> that's pelt call in the kettle black because i don't know how to get out of my head whatsoever well this is certainly a thing i i think both you and i struggle with this to some degree which is yes you get in your head and you overthink things and sometimes yeah it's the analysis paralysis yes yeah yeah for real do you have any do you have any i mean you've told me a couple of things that have helped occasionally, but maybe just for the sake of the podcast, what do you, what do you do to try and get out of your own head? Oh, God, I <laughs> wish I knew. Um, <laughs> Tries to get out of his own head truly, to answer truly, the question. Go, yeah. Just disassociate. Uh, no, I go for, I don't know. Go for a walk. Uh, exercise helps. Exercise. For sure. Genuinely exercise definitely physical helps. exercise. It doesn't have to be rigorous get out into yeah. nature yeah um, yeah not that you there's much uh, is there much nature in la i don't think yeah. there is is there, Ge- is there? Ge- genuinely yeah there's god i have it. such such narrow-minded views of different places in the united states i've never been to no, utah well, and la are deserts in my head <laughs> well la is certainly a desert but uh, we're surrounded by beautiful mountains with like you know forested hikes and you know of course um yeah of course yeah and then the ocean so Right. Oh, yeah. That you're right next to. The, wow. So, so there, you know, there's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's, there's some diversity of, uh, of, uh, outdoor activity here. And Do then there's par- there's all? parks as well. I, Do ju- I don't, I yeah. don't journal. I know a lot of people find that helpful. I, I have not tried Same. journaling. Same. Yeah. I did the, I did it once when I couldn't sleep. Yeah. I couldn't sleep because I'd had too much coffee. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get up. Because I've learned that if you can't sleep in 10 to 15 minutes, you should get up and read a book. Mm. But I didn't have a book that I was reading. So I was like, okay, I'll journal for 15 minutes. And didn't really help. But then maybe that's because I was trying to get to sleep rather than trying to get my ideas out. I know right. that a lot of people say that journaling is very helpful, especially if you have like a lot of difficult things that you're working through and those kind of things so maybe journaling will help in terms here's, of your decision making here's where i can so. what i can relate it to is sometimes sometimes what happens to me is uh all of a sudden i they're like hey can you work on saturday and then oh this somebody else calls like work tuesday 
And then, oh yeah, you've got a Zoom meeting Tuesday morning before that. And like, actually there's an audition here. And suddenly I've got like six things that are in my head that I know are coming up, but I don't remember the times. And so I put them in a note or on a, and I'm not usually a calendar keeper. I'm not very good at it, but when yeah. I'm overwhelmed like that, I write down everything that's in my head that needs doing. And now yes. it's written in one place and I realize it, it's not that overwhelming. You just start checking things off the list. And so I feel like journaling yeah. is almost like that for your, your random intrusive thoughts, which is like, just write them down. And now they're, <laughs> they're somewhere. Yeah, there's there's this great tool that I found, and I will preach it to every everybody. It doesn't matter if you have ADHD or not. It's called Goblin dot Tools, and it uses it uses uh, Chat GPT, I think, on the back end. And you literally, and this might be good for if the summer, if some of the things that you're wanting to do seem so large a task that you wouldn't be able to like, oh, well, I want to go on this camping trip, but I, ha I have so many things that I have to do before I do the camping trip. So you go to goblin. Is it goblin.tools? Hang on. <laughs> I have to check this now. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, go Gob goblin yes, tools sounds like it can take you to the wrong sort of website. It's yeah. goblin.tools. Okay. Right. Uh, and they have a, a task breakdown. So you say... I want to go camping and it will create a task list that you can tick off of all the steps you need to do to get to that camping thing. Okay. And then if there's a part that you think, oh, that's, that seems too large a task. I need to, I need to break that down more. You can just click the button, expand, and it will break it down into further tasks for you. It just kind of makes general assumptions about what those tasks are. It is wonderful when you have a large task that you need to be doing and you right. are kind of vaguely aware of the steps but you need it clarified yeah. just somewhere cannot recommend it enough goblin.tools uh go use it donate to the guy that set it up it's it's marvelous it also has like an email thing there to for when you need the email to be more classy or less classy okay <laughs> to make it less make it less formal make it more formal and it also has a tone reader where you can take you can take uh what people what you're about to say to someone and you can see whether that tone is like is this a happy tone that's or do I, funny it kind of gives you the impression of what the tone of that could be which is useful for people that can't that, that struggle with tone when it comes to text and things like that yeah goblin.tools goblin you know. yeah all right i think i think we're done with the yeah is that that's the goblin that's okay. the goblin yeah torrance is just holding reaching his for his tools he's holding his claws up yeah um i i without breaking strike laws <laughs> what do you want to plug torrance <laughs> uh I don't know. Follow, follow, follow me on social media. There you go. At, at Torrance Coombs. At Torrance Coombs. Follow, you know, Instagram, threads, uh, uh, Twitch. Are you on the threads? Are you on the threads? I'm on the threads. We'll see. Yeah. I'll, I, I might start threading a bit more. We'll Threading. I used to, you know what? I used to love tweeting because I used to love words even more than pictures and coming up with random, like just putting down thoughts I had or like jokes I came up with. Yeah, and then I really went off it, but I wonder maybe I'll rediscover a love for that we'll on see. threads. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, are you gonna are you gonna be uh, streaming on Twitch? Yeah, again? we'll be streaming yeah. on Twitch again soon. Nice, back back up okay. and running very soon. What kind of things do you do on Twitch for those who have never watched you on Twitch? Oh, so we we uh, I mean we chat, we could we talk uh, we talk acting business, we we uh, we play some games together, and uh, and I'm gonna start incorporating more music too. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. Yeah. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. No, it's so great. I'm, and we, sometimes, we sometimes even Miles appears on the stream. And, I do. And, and yells. I do. We need Shriek, to. Shrieking. <laughs> okay. All right. We need, to, we need shrill, to get back to. Uh, sibilant. Um, we need to get back to Twitch and and get on Fortnite again, but the current yeah. season is terrible. And I don't I'm care. I'm I'm enjoying it honestly. Are you? Okay. I embraced I embraced the jungle. I've enjoyed it. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll join you on that we, one when we, you get back. Let's get then. some games in. I've I, I've been playing it. We should get some games in. I'd love it. 
All right. Well, thank you for joining me, Torrance Coombs, everybody. And uh, we will Miles see Dawson, you. Miles everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will see you next week for another episode. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.